So the ABO being the first and foremost blood group that we deal with in the blood bank, today we're moving on to the RH system, which is like the runner-up. We've got Miss America or Miss Blood Bank, and now we have the first runner-up, the RH system. So we're going to talk about the RH system, and that's going to give somebody their blood type. So you're going to be an A positive or an a, a B negative or an O positive, or an AB negative, or whatever their blood type is. This is the other half of their blood type. Okay, so, um, in 1939, in 1939, Levine and Stetson were taking care of OBGYN patients, and they noticed um, one patient in particular who was a, a woman who had given birth to a baby who was severely infected by hemolytic disease of the newborn. Um, they knew about hemolytic disease of the newborn for a long time. They knew that, that there was a lot of, of circumstances where babies were born dead or very, 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 very critically ill and died soon afterwards. Um, it usually occurred on second, third, fourth children not usually the first children that were born to particular mothers. But they'd known about this for quite some time, but nobody quite knew what um, was causing these babies to die. But of course, if you think back in those days, we had, you know, there's no real aseptic technique. There's, uh, you know, we've gotten beyond the leeches and the, the bear skins and the rocks and all that kind of stuff, but we, we were still very much uh, rudimentary when it came to medical treatment. And so it was kind of uncertain as to what was causing the problem. But this one particular woman uh, had given birth to this baby, and she had lost a lot of blood during the birthing process. And so because she had lost a lot of blood, and this was back in the days before, before they had blood banks, you know, routinely in hospitals, they decided they were going to give her a transfusion. Well, her husband just happened to be there, so let's give him some of his blood because he's here and he's willing and he's able and he's concerned. And so they gave some of the, the husband's blood to the mother, and the mother had a severe transfusion reaction. And so at that point in time, Vivian Stetson hypothesized that there was something, some factor in the father's blood that had been passed on to the baby that the mother was having some sort of a reaction to. And in actuality, they, they were very much correct in that assumption. At this point in time, they were still trying to put two and two together and figure out exactly what was causing the problems. Now, a couple of years later, in 1941, we have Lansdiner and Wiener, who for some reason, that unbeknownst to me, they decided they were going to take Reese's monkey red cells and inject them into guinea pigs and rabbits. And so then they took the antibodies that, or whatever plasma that they had in these um, in guinea pigs and rabbits, and they tried to react them with human red cells. And they found out that the human red cells that they tested reacted with about 85% of the people's blood that they tried to mix the antibody with. So then they start kind of saying, well, maybe, maybe it's the same one that um, Levine and Stetson had found a couple years earlier. Maybe we're, we're all looking at the same antibody here, it's just from different sources. So they called it the RH after the Reese's monkeys. Now, a few years later, it was determined that the, the antibody that Lansteiner and Wiener had found was not exactly like the, the antibody that had been found in, in the multiparous women. It wasn't exactly the same, but it was very close and it reacted very similarly. So they had to say, okay, well, biochemically these are two different antibodies, so we can't really call them the same. So they took the antibody that Landsteiner, Landsteiner and Wiener found and they called that the LW, so they, they're forever. <laughs> <laughs> in our minds. Um, and uh, then they had to say, okay, well, we're going to call this other antibody that we have here that we're finding in these multiparous women. Well, they called that one D. And I used to think 
that was because they had used A, B, and C for the ABO types, because remember we didn't have we didn't know about A, B at the time. Or we didn't know about O at the time, so we had A, B, and C, so I kind of thought, okay, they just took D and they moved on with it. Well, that really wasn't the case. Because if you read up any of the history, and I love to read some of them, this old history, because to me it's just totally um, intriguing on, on, the, on how things get, get put together, sort of like, you know, let's take some of this blood and shoot it into these guinea pigs and rabbits and see what happens kind of stuff, you know. Um, but they, uh, they actually had monkey deed when Landsider and Wiener were um, doing their testing. Monkey deed was the one that actually had the antibodies, so that's how they, they named it deed until they skipped C. Okay, there we have the history of why it's called anti-D. Uh, we can get into some of the differences between the biochemistry of the two antibodies, but I think that's, that's better set for when we get into the antibody groups, because we find antibodies because of the antigens being there, and so today we're sort of working on, on the antigens themselves, so we'll work on the antibodies later on, but they do react very similarly, and um, you have to, to do a few extra tests to determine whether you have an LW or have an anti-D. You don't see LW that often, you see anti-D eh, relatively often. Okay, so the RH antigen, which is now called D, is roughly found on about 85% of the population. It is the most immunogenic of all of the antigens. It's much more immunogenic than the, the A and the B. The A and the B are common sugars, and so you see them often. With the D antigen, you have to be exposed to it. You have to um, be pregnant or be transfused to be exposed to this D antigen before you make the antibodies to it. But there, if you look at some of the statistics, they say that if an RH negative person gets as little as one ml of RH positive blood that they could, are exposed to, if you're talking about a, a delivery, they could theoretically make the antibody. It's much more immunogenic than any of the other blood groups or the, any of the other antigens. Okay. There are actually 50 antigens that we know about that are all associated with the RH. Uh, the main ones, are, of course, the D, the big C, the little C, the big E, and the little E. There, there's been various theories that have come about, but right now, the theory that is pretty much accepted and um, they feel like they have proven is that there's two adjacent genes, the RHD and the RHCE gene, that are very closely connected on chromosome one. And so they, they're two separate, but, but interacting, I guess is a good way to put it, um, genes. The D is either there or it's not. If it's there, the person's RH positive. If it's missing, the person is RH negative. Um, with, the, with the RHCE, there can be, be various combinations. And so it's very polymorphic, I guess is the best word to use for that thing. Um, it's not a sugar like the ABO. It's, um, it's a protein. It's nine glycosylate. Nine, 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 I'm having trouble talking today. Um, and the, the genes or yeah, the genes themselves actually wrap 12 times through the membrane. Not the genes, the antigen. Wrap 12 times through the membrane. So it really has a lot to do with the membrane integrity for the red cells. They think that it could be an ion channel to get rid of waste products. They're not quite sure exactly what, why this particular antigen wraps 12 times through the cell membrane, but it does. It just doesn't hang out there and say hi. Um, okay, so Back in, I guess, the 80s, we'll say the 80s, they didn't know about these two closely related genes. They were different theories. And so even though the theories themselves are pretty much discounted, the nomenclature that's associated with the theories 
is widely accepted. So in order to be a blood banker, you got to talk to jargon. So you got to know, got to know the nomenclature, and that's just life. <laughs> I was thinking about that the other day. I was like, do you have an R two R two cell? I'm like, I need a, I need an R zero little R cell. You know, and I'm, and my student is like, oh good, I really do need to know this stuff. Don't I? I'm like, yes, you do. Okay, so I'll just warn you right now that even though you think it doesn't make any sense, it really isn't that hard, and you really truly do need to know. Um, how to use them interchangeably. At least the Fisher race and the Wiener. The Rosenfeld, I have no use for. I've never used it. I, it's not hard. It's just kind of cumbersome. And the ISBT is just ridiculous. But according to your book, you should know them all. But truly, the two most important are going to be your Fisher race and your Wiener. So Fisher race, uh, their, uh, their hypothesis really was that there were, there were, they were separate antigens. The antigens themselves were all separate. So they were all on their own little low side and they had their own alleles and everybody was happy. So in order to do your nomenclature for a type, you just put down what the most common find, finding was. So if you took someone who reacted with anti B, with anti C, not with anti E, with anti little C, and with anti little E, I mean, yeah, with anti little E, if you were using the fish array system, this is what you would, it would equal. It would be big D, little C, big, big D, big C, little E, and then little D, little C, little E. Um, the D being an amorph, it just basically takes up space. There is no little D antigen. Okay, so this this was Fisher Race's um, theory back in I want to say the seventies. Rosenfeld was I think in the sixties. Fisher and Weir was the sixties. Fisher Race was the seventies. So it's kind of a little bit more progressive set, um, thinking, I guess. Um, with Wiener, his idea was it was one antigen and it was different, different epitopes of one antigen. So if you had the same reactivity, you would have a big R1 and a R. So this reactivity will just tell you which epitopes you were, te you were testing for. You got to remember this was back in the days before we had um, a lot of the biochemical testing that we could do, um, no PCR. None of the none of the, the really esoteric stuff that we can do today. Um, so the ideas were, were pretty valid. Now, when you talk about Rosenfeld, like I said, I've never used Rosenfeld. I don't know anybody that ever has used Rosenfeld, but it's not really hard. You just basically put your your antigens in order, and this one's one, two, three, four, five. And so if you were going to take this reaction. You would have Rh12 negative 3 because this one's not reacting, 4 or 5. I wouldn't spend a whole lot of time memorizing that or working through that. The first two, yes, that one, not really. Um, and the last one with ISBT, um, RH system is 004, and you basically use the same numbering system that you do with the Rosenfeld, and so Big E would be. So 00403 actually equals E. So you have a long number for each one of the antigens. I've never seen that written out as far as anybody saying, okay, here, here's your cell. It probably would be this long. We have all these different antigen types with all these different numbers. Don't, don't spend a lot of time on that. I will tell you that you will get, and I can almost guarantee you, even Outside of this classroom, you will get a question that will say, you have an R2 little r patient. What antibodies could he potentially make? They're in the RH system. So you have to be able to know which antigens the R2 little r person had so that you would know what antibodies they could potentially make. Classic test question. Classic. You will, I will give you some, and you will see them again. So note to self. Um, spend a little bit of time trying to, to to make that your own. It's the thing that's best about the blood bank 
Well, there's lots of good things about blood bank, but one of the really fun things about blood bank is you learn the foundation, and then you use logic to figure out what's causing your problem. So there's not a lot of, this is our normal range, you know. A potassium is, let's put potassium, 2.5 to, to 5.5 milligrams per deciliter. Um, there's not range for everything. Everything has to be interpreted, and you have to look at statistics. So it's all very statistics driven. That's why with a fish and race, this reaction may not be somebody who is necessarily this genotype. But because that's the most common, that's what we're going to look for. There are people who have, they have a D antigen, but they don't have any of the rest of them. Um, they don't have any of the rest of them. And these are called D-dash dashes. Um, D-dash dashes have the strongest expression of the D antigen. You won't see them very often. But they can potentially make antibodies to all the other um, antigens that are RHAGs, RHCs. Um, I had one the other day. I had um, a patient who had a, an antibody to the DD, and he also had an antibody to the Little League. So therefore, when you have these patients, they become very cumbersome and very um, difficult to find compatible blood for because the, the, the norm is for somebody to be positive for one or the other or both. To find somebody who's negative for both of them is very unusual. So we have this D dash dashes. If you had to find the second most um, strongly expressed D antigen, you would look for the R2 little R, I mean, R2 R2. Those are your second after the D dash dashes from the strongest expression. So that's when, if you're looking for something to try to react or to try to absorb out, and you want to have something that's going to, going to show a positive reaction, you would go for your R2, R2 cells, but you're not going to have E dash dashes. They're not going to be there. They're going to be frozen somewhere for some research purposes, or if, if you have somebody with an antibody that has to have some. Um, there's also RH nulls, and RH nulls basically don't have any antigens. They're totally devoid of the RH antigens altogether. Now because that that antigen goes in and out of the cell membrane 12 times, obviously it's going to have some impact on the cells themselves. So the cells are not very um, resistant or, or they are very fragile and so you tend to have a hemolytic anemia with these patients tend to have um, the stomatocytes, you know when you're in hematology you have the little smiley face cells, so you still you tend to have stomatocytes in these patients. Luckily they don't need transfusions, They're, they tend to compensate and be able to exist on somewhat lower um, hemoglobin than is normal just because of their, their overall condition, but you do see that. Um, everybody good with that? Very good. You think you cap on with all of this? <laughs> okay, so testing for the D antigen. Alright, so we routinely test for the D antigen. That is the other part of our blood type. We do what we did last week and then we're going to do um, the extra additional testing that we're going to do today. It's going to be added on to give us our blood type. We're going to be a negatives or B positives or O positives or AB negatives or whatever the blood type is that you come up with. Now, keep in mind, D does not have that antithesis reaction. So if the D antigen is there, you're not going to necessarily have anti-D. You're only going to have anti-D if the patient's been exposed to the D antigen at some point in time in their life. And then it's likely that they will have made the antibody, but it's not a given. It's not like the ABO system. So without exposure, you don't 
expect the anti to be there. So we're not going to take the plasma and run it against Rh positive cells to see if we get a reaction. Unless we come up with something we don't expect. But that's two or three weeks from now. So that we'll worry about. Okay. The other antigens that are in um, the RHCE system, we don't routinely test for. There are some places, especially pediatric facilities, that might. Um, a lot of places are going to test for them because once you make one antibody, the likelihood that you're going to make more, especially in the RH system, uh, tends to increase. So some places are going to go ahead and get your baseline, especially for patients like sickle cell anemia patients who get uh, excessive numbers of transfusions over the course of their life. So there is a big push uh, for trying to give some kind of a matched blood to those patients so that they don't make the antibody. And the theory is, is if they come into the hospital in a crisis, they won't have the antibody, so you don't have to compensate for it. But um, if they come in and they just need a normal transfusion, then you find blood that matches their own as closely as possible to whatever end you want to make it. And then you're going to prevent them from making those antibodies so if they do have a crisis, then their life will not be in danger because of the possibility of, of not getting compatible blood quickly enough. So some places, like I said, pediatric facilities are going to test for the other ones routinely. But even then, it's something that, you know, everything is money driven. And so it, you're not going to be able to, to charge for it. So if you did it, then it was something that the hospital would have to absorb the cost for. And so you have to kind of uh, say, okay, this is a patient safety initiative. Is it worth the extra expense? How much is too much? Where do I stop? Um, is, is there some place to stop? Because you want to give the patient the, the best possible product that you can, but in this kind of a circumstance, you're, it's not really a bad product you're giving them. You're sort of doing a lot of work now to prevent yourself from doing a lot of work and a lot of having a lot of headaches later. So it's a little bit, a little bit different in that, in that case. There are um, two populations of people that you have to do a weak D on, and weak Ds are um, exist because of of different expressions, different genetic expressions. So your two populations that you have to do weak Ds on are um, babies who are born to Rh negative mothers, and if you're a donor center, donors. And that would be obvious because you wouldn't want to give uh, somebody who is Rh negative an Rh positive unit of blood and sensitize them. Okay. So what ends up happening, and I'm going to trust that you guys have, have looked through your lab for today, what ends up happening is you take just like your ABO, you take a drop of your anisera and drop of your cell suspension, and you mix it up and you spin it down and you read it. Okay. It's positive, it's positive. If it's negative, then that's when you do the weak D. And in order to do a weak D, you put it in your heat block. So everybody has a heat block. We need to watch yours because yours was a little bit cold earlier. Everybody else is okay. Um, um, you're going to put it in a heat block for at least 15 minutes, and then you're going to take it out, and you're going to spin it down, and you're going to read it again. Because anti-D's optimum temperature is body temperature. It's 37 degrees. It's not like ABOs. ABOs have a wide thermal amplitude. They go anywhere from refrigerator temperature to 37 degrees. But with RH and a lot of these other systems that, that are significant, they react at body temperature. So you want to give it its optimum temperature and allow it to react if it's going to. So then you're going to take it out and you're going to spin it down. And if it's negative, then you're going to put saline in. I'm going to show you how to do this before we get started. You're going to put saline in and you're going to wash everything that's not attached off. Then we have something that's called anti-hemoglobulin, which is your green stuff in your rack. It doesn't have to be green. It just, it's nice to have green because it's a couple ball, you know, that you put it in. Um, you add anti-hemoglobulin. Anti-hemoglobulin is antibody to antibody. Okay. 
doesn't specifically say, oh, this is anti D, I'm going to attach to it. It just knows this is a human antibody, I'm going to attach to it. So it's antibody, it's anti, anti antibody. Okay, so then you put that in there and then you spin it down and you read it again. This time, if you get a reaction, you could potentially have an Rh positive person. The problem is, is it, it doesn't differentiate. It's antibody to antibody. So if there's something else, if you have some other kind of autoimmune problem going on in your body, then it may detect that and think it's an Rh positive. And if you call them an Rh positive, then you've made a grave error. So you have to ensure that what you're, react, what you're reading is actually a reaction that you want to be reading. So in that case, you want to use a control. So everybody has a control. Um, control is inert. It's about 6 or 7% albumin. There's no antibody in it at all. And so all you do is take your cells and you run them in the same series of reactions that you do the D. So if the D is negative, you're going to take that tube and you're going to put it in your heat block and you're going to make another tube and label it C. Put a drop of your control, put a drop of your cells, put it in the heat block with your, your D tube. Then when it comes out, you're going to spin it down and you're going to read it. And then you're going to wash it when you wash your D. And then you're going to add antihemoglobulin to it when you add your antihemoglobulin to your D tube. Now, if your D tube is positive and your control is negative, that validates that reaction in the D tube. It says, okay, this, this, this reaction in the D is valid because my control is negative. If your control is positive, then that invalidates it, and you can't call it an Rh positive. You have to say it's Rh negative, possibly Rh positive, can't determine it at this point in time, go back and do some other testing, something that positive in the control invalidates the D. And so if I told you the first week we always err on the side of safety, so if that's the case, we can't determine whether that patient's truly an Rh positive or negative, then we're going to call them an Rh negative, well, we can call them an Rh indeterminate, but we're going to give them blood based on them being an Rh negative because we want to err on the side of safety. If they're Rh positive, we give them Rh negative blood, we're not hurting anything. If they're Rh negative, we give them Rh positive blood because it's sensitize them. So we always want to err on the side of safety. So that's what we're going to end up doing. Okay, so you've got that control. There's a second thing that you need to do the con with the control that we didn't do last week, and that is this anti-D has about the same protein concentration as either the A or the B. Okay. They're all, they've got different antibodies, but their protein concentration is the same. Um, back in the 70s, into the 80s, most of the anti-D came from a human source. So the antibody had a high protein concentration. And basically, you wanted it to have a high protein concentration because you wanted it to be able to react to the immediate spin. And basically, high protein, all it does is it's a physical enhancement that shoves the antigens and the antibodies closer together so they have the opportunity to react. But the problem was, sometimes when you had this high protein environment, the cells were reacting, but they really weren't reacting to the D. They were kind of just kind of blocking up, making it low because of the protein. So um, you always had to run a control with them if you were using human source anti-D. You can still buy human source anti-D, but I don't know that it's very widespread. If you ever do buy human source anti-D, instead of those three tubes that give you your forward type, you're going to add a fourth. You're going to add a control because you need to. That human source anti-D is a higher protein concentration than these monoclonals or polyclonals that we're using. The difference is, is if you have a positive in all three of these tubes, you need a negative control. So in that case, you want to use this control. So for an AB positive patient, positive, 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 you want to have a fourth tube for your control. That's in addition to your reverse pipes. Okay, that makes sense. So that's a little bit different. Um, the other, after they, they went from human sources, they went to chemically modified anti-D. And a chemically modified anti-D They went 
went in and basically broke some of the bonds in here so that there was more of a hinge. And so it, it could it could span the antigen easier and you could get a reaction faster. So you had chemically modified anti-D, or they called it saline anti-D. I don't know that you can buy that anymore. This, is, um, this was supposed to be the whiz bang before we had but it clones that did all this stuff for us. Okay. Nowadays, we usually use polyclonal for pretty much all of our antiseries. There's a few antiseries that we still get from human source because they don't really have a good, a good cell line to be able to make um, a polyclonal source. But for the most part, we are going to use polyclonal, which is a mixture of monoclonal cells and bodies. And that's what we're doing here. Um, just as an aside, if you look at your anti-human globulin, I think I purposely gave everyone anti-IgG C3D. This is called poly anti-human globulin because it's going to react against IgG and a complement faction that antibodies can, can bind when they're binding together with blood growth systems. So most of the time the complement is going to be involved in IgM or cold reacting antibodies, but occasionally there are a few that do bond complement that are 37 and are significant. So in that case, you're going to use poly for those. But we'll get into the difference in the different anti-hemoglobulins a little bit. A little bit later on, uh, so we're going to talk about RHML. All right, so we have polyclonal, we have human source, we have weak deep testing, we have control, and we have anti-hemoglobulin. So that's what's grown into your rack. Everybody good with those? Sort of. <laughs> okay, so if you you can give D positive blood to D negative patients if the antibody is not present. So let's say we had um, I don't know we we had a atomic bomb dropped out in out on 441 and somebody was bleeding to death and I knew I was no positive and you were no negative and I'm going to give you an arm to arm transfusion. Well, you always weigh the alternative that. Is my transfusion of O cells going to help you more than the possibility of you making an antibody? Um, level one trauma centers. O negatives, because they don't have any of the antigens, can be given out uncross-matched if you know, there, there's a possibility of the patient um, dying before you can actually finish all your testing. Um, some places are going to give O negatives routinely. When you start getting into the level one trauma centers, most of the time, you're going to give O negatives to women who are under whatever they can consider childbearing ages and children, and they're going to give the men, sorry, the men and the old women, they're going to give them O positives because they're not going to have to worry about future children, and I'm going to save your life today so that you know you may have anti-D the next time you come in, but today you will live to tell it again. Even the places that routinely give Rh negative, give O negatives out as cross match blood, because smaller places are going to give O negatives out to everybody. They're not going to differentiate. Um, they're going to reach a point that they have to switch blood types. They have to because they will run out. And so at some point in time, they can switch over to, to Rh positive, even if their their protocol will say that we need, they need to have Rh negative first. So it, it's entirely acceptable, and there's about an 8% chance that if you get some Rh positive blood and your Rh negative, that you will come. Type D. Now, you said you didn't know your blood type. Do you know your blood type? You know your blood type? How fabulous. We can all find that out. Okay, now, there's one other thing that we go back to. Um, the Setson and Levine um, case, they found that if they took human source anti-D from these multiparous women who had given birth to children who were usually dead, that they could prevent um, the antibody production in, in women who've given birth to Rh positive blood. And so that's the whole premise behind Rogam. Rogam or whatever other sort of like Kleenex. You know, Kleenex are tissues. Well, Rogam, there's other manufacturers of 
you know, RHD immunoglobulin, but Rogam is, is the thing that you think of most prevalently. Rogam is nothing more than concentrated purified anti-D that came from somebody. And they, what they do is you take a person who could have potentially been exposed to RH positive blood and you put this anti-D in them and the whole idea is that the anti-D binds those cells floating around and latches onto them so they can be taken out of circulation before the patient can form the antibody itself. It's been very, very, very successful. It was introduced in the 60s. Um, the whole thought process is that for a viral program, it will be enough to eliminate 15 mLs of packed cells or 30 mLs of whole blood up to 72 hours after exposure. Now, I always thought this was kind of interesting because who believes in packed cells? But here we go back. I'll tell you a little story about the history on this one, too. Back when they were doing the trials, they had prisoners, and I doubt very seriously they could do this anymore, but they had prisoners volunteer for the test trials, and they had the prisoners for 72 hours, and they injected them with 15 <laughs> various amounts, the 15 mLs of pack cells and 30 mLs of whole blood was what protected them with one vial of Rogan. Um, and the 72 hours was because they only, prisoners were only out of jail for three days. So we know it, it lasts or it's effective up to 72 hours. If you ever have a situation, which has happened and probably will happen, where the patient comes in and leaves AMA and you haven't gotten her Rogam yet. Mother's positive, mother's negative, baby's positive, oh, we've got to give her Rogam. Oh, she's gone. What am I going to do? Well, four days later, she comes back in because she's decided that um, she needs a, a tubal ligation. At that point in time, it's like, oh, we missed our 72-hour window. Don't ever, don't ever say that because we don't really know whether or not it would be effective on some patients further out. We know it's going to be effective within 72 hours. So if you have the option of giving it before the 72-hour window is, you know, elapses, do so. But if it's beyond 72 hours, go ahead and try it. It's $150 injection, so it's it's well worth the expenditure if, you know, for some reason you can prevent the woman from making anti-D. Um, I don't know that there's a whole lot of, of research out there because you probably only have a handful of people who don't fall into that category where they get their Rogam. But if you think about 80% who've been exposed making anti-D, um, it's well worth the expense. So um, by all means, take it, take it for a grain of salt and, and utilize it to the best of your ability. But that's the reason why you're going to go with Program. Okay, and that's way down the line of labs that we will we'll talk about Rogam and we'll do Rogam candidacies and, and all that kind of thing. But as long as you know at this point what Rogam is and what its function is, then you have made all of the necessary adjustments to what you need.